Today's post in YRR Milrose Games edition of Track Talk is brought to you by Floyds of Leadville. Many runners are turning to CBD products to aid in recovery and pain management. Floyds of Leadville is so confident in the quality of its natural, organic CBD products, it shares the certified lab results of its products on its website. Check out floydsofleadville.com and use code Let's Run Feb 10 to save 10% on your first order. That's floydsofleadville.com and code Let's Run Feb 10. All right, let's get this thing started. Stars of track and field are beautiful people. Breaking news, everybody. Move over, Lance Armstrong. El Chapo. Guilty on all counts. Now the greatest drug cheat in history. Welcome, everyone, to the fifth Let's Run.com track talk of 2019. A special Milrose Games post rap show. I'm Walden Johnson, joined by Jonathan Galt and Robert Johnson, as always. Welcome, guys. And first, when it comes to Milrose, we can't get into the action right away because you can't talk about Milrose 2019 without talking about the tragic incident with Kamoy Campbell. But we have positive news starting off. John, you talked to Kamoy's former coach, Mark Coogan, last night. And the words are, they were great from our perspective. Kamoy is doing better, quote, he's smiling, quote, and 100% coherent. So that's great news for running fans everywhere, runners, human beings everywhere. There's no way we can start off with anywhere else. Kamoy, his family, everyone, you're in our thoughts and prayers. John, kind of tell us about what you learned last night or anything you want to say about it. Yeah, I think you mostly said what, what I heard from Mark is that He's doing better. He had been sedated for about 48 hours after the incident. It was very scary, I think, for everyone who was at the meet, who was watching on television, who heard about it. There was a lot of outpouring of success, of support from the running community for Kamoy. And yes, he's breathing on his own. He had to be, uh, I think, a ventilator or a respirator or something. He had assisted breathing uh, for the 48 hours right after his incident. And so the fact that he's breathing on his own, that he remembers his girlfriend, that he's 100% coherent, all of those are good signs. They're still trying to figure out exactly what happened to him and what caused it. So he's going to remain in the hospital for tests. But certainly positive news from uh, the Campbell camp on Monday night and Tuesday morning. And we wish him all the best in his continued recovery. Yeah, it was a harrowing scene at the track. I mean, you and I didn't know what was happening till well after the race was over. This sort of shows how chaotic it is to track me, especially in a place like the Army where it's loud and we're interviewing athletes. And Grant Fisher was the first one who's alerted us to anything. But thanks to all the medical people at the Armory, the people who first responders, people jumping on the track, whoever it was, like if Kumoy makes it through this. I think it's because of the response of the people. And, you know, I think on Let's Run, there's been a lot of people sharing firsthand accounts of what they saw and some were critical, some weren't, some were full of praise. But I think if you host events, everybody, like take a look at your emergency plans, make sure you got a plan in place and make sure everyone knows like what's going to happen because it shows someone was pumping his chest in under two minutes in this case, but 30 seconds make a difference. So you're not thinking it attract me. This is what's going to happen. But, you know, by the grace of God, people were there quickly. Maybe they could have been quicker, but it was a pretty scary scene Saturday night and it's great news that it looks like he's going to live. And I can't believe some people on the forums were saying, well, he's never, he may never run again. I'm like, what? Are you kidding me? That's your concern? I mean, running sort of seemed, you know, insignificant after all of this. And I think sort of Joe Kovacs said that afterwards, the shot putters were probably 20 feet away and they didn't really know what was going on for a few minutes. And then they, the, the competition resumed. And that was one thing that everyone's sort of been universal in the criticism. The meet tried to resume while Kamoy was on the track and, that was a total breakdown in communication. But they were saying eventually once he left the track and it did resume, it was, you have a different perspective. Throwing a ball really far isn't just, doesn't have quite the significance it did right before that. So it's a dose of reality for us all. And I just hope the best for him and his family. Big action at Milrose though, turning to the track. It's the crown jewel of the indoor track circuit in the United States. And that was the world record attempt in the mile by Yomif Kajelcha. And oh, so close was it. 
There's a lot of world record attempts that never get going or never come close. And this one was as close as you can get. Missing the world record by one one hundredth of a second. I mean, what a race it was. A great atmosphere, sort of those last couple of laps. People were yelling at him, waving at the track, urging him on, and he just missed it by 0.01. So second fastest mile ever, but not the world record. I'm not sure where we should begin with the world record discussion, but let's devote some time to that now. Robert, you were at home. You probably have a more level-headed look at it when you're watching it on TV. Kind of what were your thoughts as the race went on and what did you think in general? Well, to be honest, I was a little distracted. I was cooking dinner at the same time and the baby was crawling on the floor. So I was kind of watching it. But, you know, to be honest, and I think we're going to get into this, before the race, I like to pay, put myself on the spot and think, what do I think is going to happen? And what I said in my mind hit, hit was, I said, I know this guy's in world record shape, but I just don't think that the rabbiting is going to be strong enough to get this job done. It brought back memories of when I had a great athlete at Cornell, Jimmy Weiner, who ended up running 341 for 1,500 meters. He was definitely in sub-four shape one one indoor meet. When they told me who the rabbit was, the guy was supposed to go like 227 for 1,000. And he was like a 226,000 guy. I'm like, they can't do that from the front. It's not going to work out. So I had conflicting things there. I was like, is he going to do it? Is he not? I kind of thought he was falling off the pace. So I, I realized like he's got a lot of work to do on this last lap. And I really didn't. I thought like he wasn't going to do it. And then I saw the time and he got close and he crossed the line. And I wasn't sure what the mark, what the time was. I, I thought for some reason, all of a sudden I thought it was 50. So I thought he got it. And then I saw, you know, Bernard Lagarde and the guys reacting and the commentator, I thought did a really good job. So it was just like, oh, wow. You know, that's it. Afterwards, sort of looking at the rabbiting, the goal for the rabbit, Rob Napolitano, was for him to come through in 153 at 880 yards. And I think Rob pretty much hit that exactly. So from like some of the people associated with the meet, they're like, hey, the rabbit hit it dead on. But as you pointed out, the record was lost on the second lap of the race. It wasn't an even 153. He went out the first lap pretty much just on pace, which pushed Kajelcha just a little bit behind. That's sort of fine, actually, if you think about it, because it takes probably, I don't know, half a second to get going. So you're actually, if you keep the pace, then you're probably going to be right on pace the second lap. But then Napolitano slammed it down the second lap and ran 26.38. And that's actually two seconds faster for 200 meters than you want to be. And that's just too much. They were fighting an uphill battle after that because I think it was smart for Kajelcha to go around Napolitano at about 750 meters because he's slowing down there and, and you can detect that slowing of pace. So if you're running like 29 or closer to maybe even 30 seconds there, if you stay behind him, you're really going to be off the record. So it made sense to keep going there, but sort of you start out right at pace, slam it down the second 200 and Kajelcha is not a miler. And so it really needed to go. It didn't need to go perfectly. It had to go really well to get the record. There's a reason it's the world record and in retrospect proved just a little too much. I thought an interesting thread on let's run was, did get rid of the finishing line tape. Did the finishing line tape cost him the world record? And other people are like, no way. And they're like, well, Kajel just sort of looks like he slows up at the end. And it's 0.01 is about either three inches or five inches, sort of depending how you view the pace. It's a very small amount. And they're like, well, if he leaned a little bit, if the tape's not there, could he eke out another three inches? There's a lot of ways you could probably we'd run that race and get three inches, but he lives on to fight another day. Right. And this is interesting because I like the post-race analysis here. It reminds me of other sports. There's things, there's a little strategy to the debate. You know, in, in hindsight, guys, he only needed a 28.32 in the final 200 to do it. I mean, most milers you think would be able to come up with that. I know they're on more record pace. So I, I don't really want to pile on Rob Napolitano. He was a great runner at Columbia. He ran 338 last year, his first year as a pro. So he's really, you know, doing pretty well. But my biggest complaint is just it didn't quite go far enough. When, when Galen Rupp ran his 350 mile, uh, Alberto got his golden boy, a rabbit for 1,200 meters. When, when Cheswick went, went 349 last year, 1,200 meters as well. And this is not even going 750 meters. I mean, not even 800 meters, 750 meters. So to me, it, it, we just when he does this attempt in a couple of weeks, he needs a better uh, someone who's a little fitter than that. I, I think you need someone who's in sub four mile shape, most likely. John Killock converted. If you're going to make it 1,200 meters at 350 mile pace, you need to be in 338 shape. So that's basically 356 mile shape. So really, I was talking to a friend today on the phone and debating who could rabbit this next rate. And obviously, there aren't that many Americans under 357 in the mile this year. 
Most of them are collegians. You got Clayton Murphy and Craig Ingalls are the obvious example, obvious things that come to mind. They're both in the Nike Oregon project, but I'm sure they wanted to run that race themselves. They think they can run 350, 351 in the mile. And then after that, you're down to Amos Bartelsmeyer. He could probably do it. He's a pro, so he doesn't have anything holding him back. Johnny Gregoric at 355 is another guy. Sam Prackel, Willie Suleiman, those are the only guys under 357. Otherwise, you're going to have to get a Kenyan. Who's the Kenyan that's been winning? What weekends are going to be? You got USA Nationals, which is another problem if it's in two weeks. Well, right. And you're going to want to be paid. And the reality is, I know for a fact, I was speaking to someone, some of these top pros have it in their contracts. They have rollover bonuses, I believe, or it may just be a rollover extra year. But if you run 350 or 351 in the mile, sometimes there's a bonus or you get a $10,000, $20,000 bonus. And then that rolls in through all the rest of the years of your contract. So in my mind, it's easy to do. If Alberta wants it done, get out the Nike checkbook and write it. It may even have to be to one of your own guys on the team. I guess you could threaten to kick them off the team if they wouldn't do it, but they're giving up the opportunity to make some serious bank that's going to roll over for a year or two. It's hard to do. And I think guys from other shoe companies, I mean, Nick Willis would, oh my God, Nick Willis, would he, he would crush the world record if Nick did it. Nick Willis ran 354. He's rabbit of those Swarthmore meets. Nick Willis could make it rabbiting a light. He could make another five years after he retires being a great rabbit because he's so even. But why would an Adidas guy want to help Nike? Answer, he wouldn't unless he's getting paid big time. I'm sure maybe if Alberto gave him $25,000, he might do it. Yeah. Uh, I just want to jump in with two points here, guys. One, finish line tapes and indoor races should be eliminated. I think just keep them for road races. I don't see the point. It, people, they're always wondering, is it too soon to stretch them out? You see people freaking out about it. It's just idiotic. They do it for some photo op for the sponsors or for the name yeah, of the meet. I just think it's dumb. Indoor finish line tape, dumb for indoor races. Second want, day. John, second we don't day. have any fans at the meets. You want, you want no sponsors at the meets too? Well, I, they spo- you could sponsor a meet without sponsoring the finishing Vir- line tape. We have a meet. virtual finish line type, sort of like the yellow line in football. Oh, I always line. dreamed of crossing a, like a marathon tape. I, I always wanted the tape. I, I love Marathon it. tape, no. For road races, it should still be there. But find another way. Put the sponsor logos like right next to the finish line or put them over. I, I don't know. I think there's a way to do it without the, the silly indoor finishing tape for every single race. Second point. You could just have it superimposed like on the bottom. Right, yeah. right past the finish line, right? Just whatever the sponsor yeah. is. Yeah, write it onto the track. Like have temporary spray paint, have the sponsor's name on the track. How about that? I don't know. Um, second Each point. Each race has a different sponsor, John. I don't think spray paint's going to do it. I virtual sponsorship. It's, it's very easy to do sort of virtual. Yeah, figure it out. They do it for like, soccer well, matches all the time. The second point. Lincoln Shrike had an article in Flow Track. He compared the rabbiting job in Cesarex 349 last year and Kajelcha's 348 this year. And it, it was very insightful because it reveals just how good Cesarex's rabbiting job was last year. Now, he had two rabbits versus one, and I don't want to demean or lessen the impact that Rob Napolitano had. I mean, it's hard to rabbit these races and to just churn out an accurate split every lap after lap. It's difficult. There's a lot of pressure. Everyone knows that he's going to be following you. and It's a world record attempt. There's certainly a lot of pressure for a young athlete, so I don't want to make it seem as if it's an easy thing to do. But Cesarek splits after the first lap, which was 209 meters in 30.59. Here is what they ran to 1,200 meters when the rabbits dropped out. 28.6, 28.4, 28.4, 28.3, 28.5. That is consistency, people. That is what you need for a world record. It was Brandon Kidder and Drew Piazza, really good job. And then Cesarek was on his own for the last two laps. He ran it in 27.98 and 28.35. If you had pacing like that again, I think that Kajelcha would easily get the world record in his next attempt. I think it's harder for one rabbit. I'm not trying to say that Rob did a terrible job. I thought his rabbiting job was a lot better than some races. I mean, he didn't start off too fast, which a lot of guys do. Oh, the, the first start was lap brilliant. I agree. They he, opened he, up he, a gap. The, the start was actually fine. I sort of probably should try to talk to him and just see what if he th- was thinking in his head, like, oh my God, I'm a little slow and just went fast. But actually I think that starts pretty close to almost perfect, but just the second lap did him in. So it wasn't c- quite as even as it could have been, but I've seen much worse rabbiting jobs. I'm not trying to say this was the worst ever, but sort of in retrospect, looking at it. Yeah. 0.01. You are bringing up a good point. Who are the next one? The Craig uh, Ingalls and Clayton Murphy. Murphy with an Olympic bronze medal. Does he want to be a rabbit for Yomif Kajelcha? Sort of interesting, sort of the dynamics in that group because those guys sometimes train with each other, sometimes have sort of different coaches. It's yeah. pretty interesting how it works on Thursday, two days before. 
Kajelcha and Murphy showed up the track. They jogged around about a mile and then Kajelcha did a workout and Murphy stood there and watched or actually did a photo shoot kind of deal. Same group. Alberto coaches both of them, but sometimes Murphy will work out with Donovan Brazier, who's coached primarily by Pete Julian. So there's yeah. some crossover. I think Ingles mostly is Julian. We want to talk about quickly some of these other guys in the race and how they finished. You know, there's many guys in the world that are capable of doing it. There's only 13 guys under 339 and for the 1500 this year. So one guy I was thinking of was Bethwell Bergen. Okay. He could do it, but I would want an American. I mean, I would almost want Robin Napolitano to run the first 800, set the pace, and then just let him keep going. I don't think you need 1200. I don't want to talk about the other guys running 353 or 354. I think it was short of what they were hoping to do. I mean, Nick Willis running 354. What What, what is there to talk about? Clayton Murphy, I, I think he learned going out. He went out. He went for it. Kudos to him. He basically ran like a 350 mile, three mile with a two flat last 880. That's pretty impressive. Whereas Craig Ingalls ran a 353 sort of the other way, going out slow. Again, I don't think that does a lot for him. It was kind of nowhere in between for them to be. What I want to talk about is Kajelcha may be good, guys, but let's don't act like this hasn't been done. As someone pointed out, pointed out in the message board, Eamon Coglin ran a 349 indoor mile on a 10 lap to the mile wooden track in 19. So 36 years ago, somebody was running basically as fast as Kajelcha on a much harder track. 10 laps to the mile. I mean, it's pretty amazing. I decided to reach out to our guru, let's run.com stat and coaching guru, John Kellogg, who was in his prime back in 1983 folks and ask him, John, how much slower was the 10 laps of the mile track is compared to one that's eight laps of the mile. Now, John, our question of the week from the let's run nation is how could someone like Eamon Coggan run three forty nine on a banked plywood track way back in 1983? How much slower do you think a track like that would be than a modern day track? I think it's about a second and a half slower for a mile than a bank 200 meter track, especially if it's boards, it might be slower than that, and maybe two seconds or two and a half seconds slower. But some people are just really, really fast on the indoor tracks because there's stride mechanics or it was uh, suitable to it, just like uh, Emil Puttermans was from Belgium. He used to run, I had a lot of indoor records way back in the day. Some people were just good at, at indoors on those tight times. And what did you say Emil ran for two miles indoors on a 10 lap to the mile track? 813.2, I think it was, maybe, maybe 813.0 indoors on a, on a short track. Thank you, John. Good to hear from you. John, this, Nation is an, John this is an a- honor. Let's Run Nation wants to know, will there be any coaching comebacks soon? I don't think John could hear that. John Walden said it's been an honor, and the Let's Run Nation wants to know whether there will be any coaching comebacks from Mr. Kellogg. I don't know. Now, maybe, maybe you know, if we can get a team together or something, maybe like a U.S. Uh, club, class national or something like that, maybe I can put a team together for that. Yep, John and I have determined earlier in the fall it would be no problem to, to take down the USATF Club Nationals. Short order, short order, John. Just like we took down those Heps Cross Country titles time after time. We'd take down the USATF Club like we won those track titles, though, John. No, no questions asked. Yeah, yeah, we'll focus on the track. <laughs> focus on those, those good years indoors and racking up all those points in the middle distance and uh, events. All right, very good. Thank you, John. All right, John, talk to you later. Bye-bye. Folks, yes, that's right. John Kellogg thinking about coming out of retirement with yours truly. Under Armour, if you're listening, we can dominate this sport here in Baltimore. Under Armour, Baltimore, let's run.com track team. Oh, special appearance by John Kellogg. Thank you, John. It is pretty fascinating that with 10 laps to a mile back in the day, guys could do that. And before we sort of talk about some of the rest of the stuff at Milrose, I was talking to Ray Flynn, the meat director, about sort of Milrose and the old circuits and how fast they ran back in the day. And then I was just like, wait, Ray, as a kid, I went to a track meet at the Reunion Arena where the Dallas Mavericks used to play, an arena that sat 17,007 people. I was a kid. I don't remember. I remember about eight or 10,000 people there. I don't know, 12,000. It was fairly full. Milrose has got, I think, 3,500 now at the Armory. Might even be less than that. And I was like, you know, and the race is other, other places too, right? Like obviously in New Jersey where the record was set and then there's races in San Diego and LA. And I, I was like, where were there? And Ray was like, oh yeah, it was unbelievable. There was like 20 cities. We should do a piece on this. Any old timers want to email us, but he's like, 
we had races in Louisville, Kentucky, in Canada. I think he said Toronto or Montreal or somewhere. L.A., San Francisco. It was just you know one indoor race after another in an arena, and the same guys raced. Ray said one week him and the crew raced in either Melbourne or Sydney in Australia on, I believe, a Wednesday. They then That was an outdoor race. They then flew east. Stopped off in, I believe, L.A., somewhere in California, had a race Friday night, and then Saturday flew to Dallas and raced the day. Yeah, all in front of 10,000-plus crowds, at least in the States. It was amazing. And the question is, what happened to that? There's now not a single track meet in America in an arena. I mean, it's kind of sad. I said, Ray, what happened? And he, he said, I honestly don't know. Cable TV? It's like people had different entertainment options. <laughs> it made me feel old. It's like cable TV, but That's I sort of, point. I think cable TV sort of came around like when we were kids. And before that, people, there wasn't a lot of sports on TV. So to go to see sports, you had to watch it. So maybe. Yeah. Even that, if you weren't a track fan, it was in town. You go to it. I mean, what else has died, folks? Part of it's Peter's fault, but the, the circus is no longer in existence. The Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey Circus is gone. So instead of, you know, you used to become before technology, you used to sort of do things for entertainment that weren't necessarily your favorite thing. Now you are competing with the all-time greatest movies. You can have all of the world's greatest movies at your fingertips immediately or books or whatever. You don't have to leave your house. So sort of the specialization is killing it. And one thing I also, the internet may have killed it. Let's run.com may have killed these internet. I mean, these meets, I'm kind of kidding, but if you race four days and three days and the same people race three times in five days, do they have the same results every time or do different guys win or do they let somebody win? I mean, nowadays the internet, you would know like, well, I crushed Weldon and Jonathan yesterday and the day before. So of course I'm going to crush him again. So why do I need to go watch it? Or you may have watched it on the internet. So you don't want to watch it again, but if you haven't seen it, you don't even know what happened. It's much more exciting. Yeah. Interesting point. You know, Milrose was a great meet, but I, I still miss it at the garden. There's just no way around it. Like, and they were, they featured this one thing they tried differently this year. And the Kamoy Campbell incident sort of clouded it a little bit was putting the shot put in the middle. And they brought in some flares this time before the mile and the shot put and shot those off and shot off smoke, trying to bring some attention to it. And it's just not the same. I remember the, this wasn't that long ago, you know, when Adam Nelson was throwing, I believe they featured the shot put at Milrose. And someone can tell me if my memory is clouded because one thing the Kamoy Campbell incident showed me is people can see the very same exact incident and remember it very differently. But I swear at the garden, they had like the strobe lights. They could dim the one. They can make the cloud black in the dark. Then they like shoot the strobe lights in the middle of the arena. And it's just, it's more of a spectacle, you know, at, at, in a 17,000 seat arena or 20,000 seat arena, whatever the garden was. But Hey, Milrose is as good as we got, and it, it was a very entertaining show. We also had two American records in the 800 meters. First, Donovan Brazier ran 144.41, but got beat by Michael Cerrone, 143.98. I think it's the only second second fastest ever and second man ever under 144. John, you can correct me on that one. Yeah, no, both of those. It's the no, third or- fastest time ever, but he's the right. second... Uh, performer under 144. It's actually crazy. Both of the times faster than him, uh, Wilson Kipketer ran at the same meet. He ran him in the semis and the finals at World Indoors in 1997, which is just pretty ridiculous. But well, without rabbits and correction, John, one was in the first round. They had three rounds back then. First round, he took it easy in the mess semifinals and then set another world record. I mean, Kip Keeter in his prime, my God, was he good. He was the prettiest runner I think I've ever seen. And that was 1997. I swear I saw those races and we, that was way before YouTube existed. So I'm not sure how I would have actually um, seen a replay of those because the internet barely existed then. Kind of curious. Robert, do you have any memory of those races? I remember seeing a replay of it for sure. It was just way, way ahead. It was like amazing. I don't think we saw it live though. Yeah, there's no way we saw it live. I actually met with a guy today, Christian Burke. He does a thing called now Roster Athletics. They kind of had a live app where you can kind of fantasy fantasy track and field. They did it with Milrose, but the main business is meat management. He also did the mapping company Indomondo. I was talking to him and he's talking about, he lives here in New York. I'd met him at Milrose. We said, let's meet up. So we live about 50 blocks apart. So we did the day. I was like, what, how'd you get in running? He's like, I was a 46 400 guy. We start talking and 
I'm like, you're Danish, right? And he started talking about world cross country. He's very excited. Once again, a plug for world cross country, everybody. If you're thinking of going, no one's emailed me. Buy some tickets, get a plane over there. There's races for the people. It's going to be a huge party. He was selling it up too. And he's like, I'm Danish. And somehow Kipster came up. And he's like, yeah, that was my coach. And I was like, what? And so yeah, he was, he was coached by Wilson Kipster. Kipster will be at the world cross country. Maybe if enough Let's Runners come on over, we can arrange a meet and greet. Walton's excited for World's Cross Coast Country, but Jonathan, do you want to share with the readers who's not excited about World Coast Country and will not be representing Team USA? My most disappointing news of the week. And I'll let John yeah. break it to you. Shelby Houlihan, to be fair to her, I think she was excited about World Cross Country, but she and her coach, Jerry Schumacher, have come to the decision not to be running. They won't have Houlihan run the world cross country this year she was the u.s champion in cross country as we talked about a couple weeks ago on the podcast it's just a bummer i know that jerry and shelby they'll have their biggest priority this year will be the world championships in doha i get that but i would just like to hear an explanation of how running the world cross country championships a race that is in march a race that is a full four months before the u.s outdoor track and field championships and a full five months before the world championships in track and field. How does running world cross in March prevent her from winning the gold medal in Doha? I personally, I don't see it's actually, sorry, it's short change. It's six months before the world championships in track and field. Wait, I just, I thought, I thought as a coach that you wanted to have two peaks a year and ideally 12, there's 12 months in a year. Am I correct? So 12, do you would want to put them ideally six months apart? Hmm, I mean, it just drives me nuts. Folks, this is a let's run first. I, in the week that was, which we just put up on the website, I, we started off, I'm praising Alberto Salazar, and now I'm ripping Jerry Shoemaker. I never thought I would see the day. It must be opposite day or something. I mean, I, I'm just not sure what's going on, but very disappointing. We, we praised Alberto because he hyped up the world record attempt. If Kamelcha runs a world record sort of out of the blue, it's not nearly as exciting if people are expecting and wanting it and debating it all week and, and, and anticipation. A big part of this enjoyment of sports is the anticipation. There's two weeks to get anticip- to anticipate the Super Bowl. That's why they have an extra week off so people can d- to talk about it, dissect it, etc. If we knew Shelby was going to World Cross Country, we'd have almost six weeks to, to, to be debating how can Team USA do? How can Shelby do? Will they both medal? I think the answer would have been yes. And now I'm like, I mean, I'm excited to go if I do go. I'm not sure with the baby if I'm going to make it there or not. But in terms of Team USA, I must don't really care. I mean, come on. Well, look at the roster. You've got so the top six finishers at USA Cross Country Shelby Houlihan, Molly Huddle, Marielle Hall, Alephine Tullymuck, Amy Craig, Courtney Frerichs. So you've got five Olympians there, plus Alephine Tullymuck, who was 15th at World Cross in 2017. That is a very, very good team. But here is the team that will be going to World Cross, assuming no one else pulls out Marielle Hall, Courtney Frerichs, then Carissa Schweizer, Stephanie Bruce, Anne Marie Blaney, Sarah Pagano. No offense to the last four women I named. They're all talented runners, but especially the last two coming in, Anne-Marie Blaney and Sarah Pagano, they're just not on the level of some of the people whose spots they're taking, Houlihan and Huddle. It's just a bummer, I think, for the fans of the sport. I think that's still a team that could maybe get a medal because after Kenya and Ethiopia, you've got maybe Uganda. I think that's still a solid US team, but it's not the best possible US team. It's just frustrating to see Houlihan. I mean, I think from what I've heard, Jerry might be worried that she might get hurt because, you know, there are a lot of hills, there's some mud, there, there's a sand pit, there are ways that some, she could twist an ankle or get, develop an injury. I don't know. To me, it's just... Hula hand um, certified? Is that a new term? If, if that's the case, that drives me nuts. She's not going to get hurt in the race. She might get hurt in the training, doing all of this longer distance training, for, you know. Right, right. She's an 850 runner. I can kind of see that. You don't want her training for 10K. So, and it's kind of a, a ways from now. It's not like it's two weeks after USA's. It's like six or seven weeks after USA's, which is unusual. But, um, you know, I, I take that back. I am excited to see what Fryworks can do. You know, I, when I was talking to John Kellogg a few weeks ago, and I'm like, John, what, a nine flat steeple, what is that equivalent to for 5,000? Because at Cornell, you know, if you have a nine flat steeple, they're going to, a nine flat steeple for a guy is basically going to score in almost any conference meet in America at the collegiate level. And most of those guys can run, you know, certainly pretty fast for 5,000 meters. And he's like, you know, for a guy, He's like, they could generally break 1430, you know, in the steeple. But so 1440s, the women's barriers are a lot shorter. So theoretically, like, what could Firex run for, for 5,000? You know, could she run a 1445? I mean, if she could break 1450, you know, you think she could be maybe top 20 at, at, at World Cross. So 
you know, there's certainly some things to be to be looking into. But very she was only six at USA's. Week. I don't know if she could finish that high. No, I'm saying if she was in that type of fitness, like, or she just so good at the steeple and the, and the berries are, are that short. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm saying like, I'm interested. I've never, obviously, we know that Jager is pretty close to a world class runner in the five thousand. He's run like what thirteen oh two or something like that. Yeah, but we, if you look at Emma Coburn's times at other events, they're nowhere close, really as close to world class or Fryricks. But I'm like, well, if they can run that fast in the steeple, my question is, can they do that for a five thousand? So you would think the answer would be yes, and you think that would translate, you know, maybe to cross country. I'm just sort of typing, ty- thinking more hypothetically here. She's obviously, I don't think she's going to do it this year because she wasn't in great shape. Well, I guess two months is a long time to get in shape. So, anyways, yeah, got a few well, other things uh, we're going to talk on, and we got to finish so I can watch the second half of some soccer game I didn't even know about. Folks, I'm not really a soccer fan. Jonathan Galt and uh, Weldon Johnson are big soccer fan. Uh, excuse me, football fans. But I have a French neighbor, and he texted me about, "Hey, Paris Germain, French." Manchester United. Then he put in parentheses, it's a soccer game. So I thought it was like one of these exhibition games that was coming up. So I, when we right before we got this podcast, I mentioned it to Weldon John. I'm like, hey, I'm going to this game. When is it? I was going to buy tickets, I thought. And they're like, it's uh, in like 20 minutes. They're like, so the neighbor who's from France doesn't have TV, he doesn't have cable. So he's coming over to watch the game. Well, the game's underway, so he better be over there right now. On a related note, and this is one reason why I've, the Nike Oregon Project, those guys race. They've always gone out there and raced, and it's very good for the sport. We need people racing for the sport. And if you're going to go do some like glorified time trial somewhere, it's not good for the sport. And that was what a lot of the Bowerman guys, the first time we've really seen them in this winter, they went out and ran a 5K in Boston on Friday. And John, you were doing double duty. You were there. But I think that race, Sean McGordy won it in 1321, made the world standard. I think Mark Scott got the standard as well, and that was it. Ryan Hall did not look good. Ryan Hill, excuse me. But I think that points out the powers that be. And I was kind of shocked, John, in New York. We found just from week number four of the podcast, quite a few prominent people are listening to this thing. So who knows who's listening internationally. But the powers that be, if you guys are listening, they need to change the qualifying for the World Championships. And they've thought about doing this, trying to reward meets and stuff. They went to a non-time standard and then realized they didn't have it implemented properly and scrapped that and went back to time this year. But even the time system, it needs to be done on a country-by-country basis. So if the U.S. already has three people in the 5,000 one year, they then can pick any three people to run the championship up to, you know, maybe find have some really soft B standard, make sure you're just not sending some joker. But like that way, these athletes do not need to go run some B race up in Boston. Like that does nothing for fans. Instead of they could have gone and run the 3K at Milrose uh, on national TV, the biggest stage, and this it's a win win. Like Sean McGordy, fan- yeah, his first race as a Bowman Track Club member against his old college teammate, Grant Fisher, who wouldn't want to watch that. That'd be awesome. Yeah, it would have been great. So, but instead they have to like worry about having a qualifying time that doesn't really even make you competitive on the world stage. So now well, like you know, nine well, guys well, in America well, or fifteen guys will run under thirteen twenty one. Once a country gets three, and if it's all in the same year. They should be allowed to send any three they want to the nationals as long as they as long as you go off the, it should be fine. You can have a national championship. If you have three people with the standard, you can have a national championship and, and pick your top three and send them to worlds. And, and, and that would make it award competition. It would like really put the downplayed incentive to go chase obscure times in the middle of nowhere. Our sport needs competition. It needs people competing on a stage. And this meet was on NBC TV. And instead, like guys are going running some time trail like i didn't even know about it until i think thursday i can't really criticize bowerman for not publicizing it because it's it's a glorified practice like, it's not something a lot of people really want to go watch well done well done what a rant you know one thing about the, about the, with worlds being in october like i i can understand chasing a standard if it's the ten thousand. so one thing i would add to that to those recommendations is one top 25 at world cross should all get the standard for the ten thousand. So just to reward people for that. And, and B, why are you worried about getting the 5,000 standard? If you can't run 1321, you're not going to make the U.S. team. So I, I don't see Yeah, but you have to issue. get it at some point, Robert. You can't just show up to the trials because USATF also said this year there's no chasing standards after the trials. Uh, we, we should actually talk about this. There's the not- World Championship standard, the window doesn't close until the first week of September. USA's are the last week of July. 
normally in a world championship year, you're allowed to change the standard. USATF saying you're not doing it. So there are people who want to knock out this standard. You can't show up to USA's well, with the 1330 season's best. Okay, you need then to get I the like that now. Point. Then I like, then I can see, I understand as a former coach myself, I can see Jerry's logic. He right. wants to bang the standard out now, then go into a base phase for a few months and then, you know, go into USA's and not have to worry about it. He doesn't like to race for options. He may not even race in between USA's. And, and well, okay. So he should let you chase it. It's, it's so stupid because otherwise you need to be in shape significantly before USA's which would be June, you need to hit the standard in June and yep. then run USA's in July. And then you've got to wait until October. So this is stupidity on the part of USATF. Yet yep. again, we've got a million dollar executive who has probably never run in track meet in his entire life. I wonder if he, if he did track in high school. I, I, I just, oh my God, this drives me nuts. So I learned this right now and I'm irate. I, you, I, it's not, I, Let's not get too inside baseball, but I agree it is a sort of, bad decision because you want the trials to be simple for people to watch. So pretty much say top three, go to worlds. Here's a better idea. If you wait a second. Standard, and if they can chase it afterwards, in theory, like if you're top three, you got a month and a half to go get the standard. Most likely most events, even if you don't have it, you're in shape, you'll go get it, especially in a distance event like that. Instead, it's like, I mean, who knows, maybe now like the sixth place person, if they have the standard can celebrate and that's better for TV, but I don't really yeah. think it necessarily, I don't think it okay, is. It's better for TV. And I, I like not chasing the standard, particularly in Olympic year, but here's the Robert Johnson rule. Put the, for Kenya and the United States, find the last day that you're allowed to, to get the standard and you put the final day of your national championships on that day. So there'll be no chasing the standard, but you'll have all summer up to the last possible day to hit it. And then you run the championships in that day and there's, you're already in prime shape. And then the, the, the worlds will be three weeks, six weeks later. You'll be in the shape of your life because it's hard as hell to make the Kenyan team. It's hard as hell to, hell to make the U.S. team. The, God, there's no reason to have it in July here. I mean, maybe the college kids don't want to keep going, but so what? No, you're right, Robert. It needs to be, I would say, maybe make it the last weekend, last week of August. That way you get a full month because then you, you, you don't want to have it USA's and then right back into – world championships right here you'd be a three-week break between september 6th and the start of worlds so maybe push it like one or two weeks before that i would say maybe four weeks out or five weeks out from the start of worlds is ideal but definitely there's no reason to have it the last weekend of july it doesn't make any sense and speaking of worlds one person who will not be at worlds is edward cheserick and john i gotta confess You've given me the Cliff Notes version of the article, but I have not read it. So tell the viewers what we've learned from the New York Times feature on him this last week. Yeah, there was a story by Matthew Futterman in the New York Times. And this is really the only source of updates we've been getting because Cheserak, whenever he's asked about it by the media, he never wants to talk about his citizenship situation. The details we learned, Cheserak is currently in the US on a visa. His visa, these visas can be granted for up to five years. His was granted for one year, and he applied for it last year in, in January of 2018. So it expired in January of 2019. He is trying to get it extended so he can just stay in the United States as a resident, as a temporary resident. And he's having problems getting that visa renewed. He's currently in an appeals process. The appeals process is going to be held in a, in a month or two. So he can stay in the U.S. until that's adjudicated. But he needs to get – in order to get his citizenship, he not only needs this visa – he needs to get a green card. He applied for a green card. It was denied. It didn't say why. And then once he has his green card, he has to live in the United States for five years until he can even apply, begin to apply for citizenship. And applying and getting granted citizenship, that can take another couple of years. Edward Cheserick's 25 years old right now. So if this is the path they're taking, he's not going to get his citizenship until he's maybe 32 or 33. And that's if things go smoothly, it's also possible that his application to extend his visa gets denied and he might have to leave the country. It, it's just not looking very promising. My take on the matter is, I guess I shouldn't be doling out advice. If Edward Cheserek doesn't want to run for Kenya, that's his option. If he wants to become a U.S. citizen and USA is the only country he wants to wants to compete for, that is his right, and I have no reason to tell him otherwise. But I would say if he ever wants to compete in an Olympics – his best option is to do it for Kenya. Kenya didn't have any guys in the 5K final in uh, Rio in 2016. They only had one guy in the World Championship final in 2017. He's in his prime right now. He's 25 years old. If he wants to go to the Olympics in 2020 or 2024, his best bet is to go to, to Kenya, a run for Kenya, compete for Kenya. But I get it. If he wants to represent the U.S. That's bad, that badly, that's his decision. 
his best bet. I don't know. Is it true? They would be to join the army W cap or is that now done for running? I believe that window might be closed the way they were getting it through the citizenship through the uh, Mavni program, I believe, because they spoke Swahili and that was viewed as a vital tool that the U S military needed. But I don't know if that way to get citizenship is still available. I think they and closed. What's, if he did compete for Kenya, how long do you have to sit out for if you wanted to switch? Well, sorry, say that again. If he does compete for Kenya, let's say he goes 2020 Kenya, and then he realizes he's going, well, he, but he probably wouldn't get it before 2024. But how long do you have to sit out for before you could switch to the US? I don't, they, I mean, they changed the rules just recently, <clears throat> but I think it's, it's going to be harder now. If he represents Kenya now, the IAF's really, they're trying to crack down on people changing allegiances. So if he comes out and says he wants to compete for the US, but He's going to start competing for Kenya. I don't know how kindly the IAF would look on that upon changing citizenship. So he's also, you're leaving something to chance and to the will of the IAF if you compete for Kenya and then try to switch. Yeah. Should we talk about the Ross All Common Half Marathon, the RAK Half 2019 version? Record 11 men broke 60 flat. But the big news on Let's Run.com, of course, was the European record for Julian Wanders of Switzerland, 59 13. He is now the fastest. We never even finished up Milrose. We even give us. Do we even mention Ajay Wilson, American record, eight hundred meters? He might have been expected, but I think it deserves a shout out before we move on. And one, yeah, one more final point on Milrose. I don't know if there's much else to add. Yeah, I mean, she's so good. We expected it, but she had two people breathing down her neck there. The final, even two hundred. I mean, I'm not honestly. Got, I'm not going to be excited tri- because, because she's run three hundred to go. She, yeah, she got trips, so she would have run faster. But her time, she's run faster herself. I mean, I can't help that they got disqualified. And she's run way faster outdoors. So I'm not really, I don't know. I, I expected that. But it was very impressive to get tripped like that and run, still get the record. And also with Milrose, I don't know, it's kind of hard to have lighthearted moments with what happened to Kamoy. But since he's doing better, I think I'll share this one. We heard about, and oh my gosh, there are a lot of let's run people at Milrose. I mean, we've got so many firsthand accounts of people witnessing the Kamoy thing was pretty crazy, but I think the Let's Run audience is like the core Milrose ticket holder. But someone said they were sitting there and a U.S. pro's family was right in front of them and something happened and they're like, I'm going to go post on Let's Run about that. So it's pretty crazy, some of the stuff going on out there. So family members, keep posting, keep refreshing the pages. Thank you very much. I'm not going to say the name yeah. of the family member, but very, very prominent performer. Milrose. No, we're keeping it quiet. Well, I will give quiet. a hit. It was not Yomif Kajelcha's mother and father. That is so Back to the RAK half. Um, you know, Julian Ronders wins 59-13. I put that in the headline. We've got a couple of emails, of course, in this day and age when someone's going to be, everyone's going to be offended no matter what you do, or someone's going to be offended no matter what you do. And um, a couple of people were complaining, like, let's run. Please do, you know, Wanders is the fastest non-African born runner in history. And they're like, you know, please stop talking about non-African born, Kenyan born, etc. And I was like, I, I tried to write back to these people and was like, you know, if everybody was born in New Hampshire, I would mention it. it, it it's just when most of the top runners are from Africa, I mention when someone's not born in Africa. And then, you know, race is obviously a, a dicey issue. What would you rather me say? I mean, I, we could also say white boy world record and not that if you're born in America, you have to be white or anything. I'm not saying that, but it's like, to me, I don't know. The fact that he's not born in Africa is significant. You know, in, in most of the world, when a minority accomplishes something, it's celebrated. When the first, you know, I'm trying to think of a recent example, well, Barack Obama, obviously the president, the first black president, that a lot of people voted for him so they could see that. When Tiger Woods, when he dominates golf, He's celebrated. Yes, he's the greatest golfer ever. Well, him or Jack Nicholas, but I think his trans ever appeal is because here was a black guy dominating a, a white man's sport. And I think Wanders is sort of he's not dominating, but he's competing. And and sort of in in John, am I crazy when I say in, in distance running a white guy or a non African born runner? I know they're not mutually the same, exactly the same thing. Is a minority. I mean, in in a in a way, yes. I mean, obviously, there are more Kenyan and Ethiopians running those times than there are Europeans. And to me, someone on the message board put it perfectly. It's not that we don't respect what 
these Kenyans and Ethiopians are doing. I mean, Stephen Kiprop ran 58.42 to win that race. That's a fantastic time. Abadi Hadis ran 58.44 to take second, and he ran that same time in Valencia last year. These are fantastic performances, but we've seen them before, whereas we have not seen a European runner running 59.13 for a half marathon. And someone on the message board put it very succinctly. It's in journalism, dog bites man, that's not a story. Because it happens all the time. Man bites dog, that's a story. Julian Wanders is the man bites dog here. He's a Swiss 22-year-old mixing up, mixing up against some of the best of the world. From and They're all from East Africa, where he trains, in the half marathon. That's, that doesn't happen very often. And that's why it's a story. And I think, I think the Robert, your sort of minority analogy isn't perfect because, I mean, Tiger Woods and Barack Obama, you know, African Americans were, you know, oppressively held back in American society, and you know, anyone's white people have been free to run f- forever. So it's not a perfect analogy, but some of it, yeah, is like because it's unique; it doesn't happen that much. And you know, like John, what you said, man beats dog, bites dog, is different. So right. and it's unique; to, it stands right. out. Yeah, it's not, not the same as like prepped. Tiger Wood. So we're coming racism that prevented golfers. But, but when, when or, Michelle, when Michelle, Wee competes in a men's PGA tour event and finishes, you know, in the back third of the pack, it's big news because it's unusual. And to say that we don't celebrate these people. I mean, I, I, I wrote a whole section on the week that was name one other place in the world that did a significant piece on how Stephen Kiprop, Abadi Hadis, Figuku Haftu, Julian, you know, uh, Morris Gachaka, Muli Washington. I'm talking, I, I put this up in the week that was, how these guys are all really young. None of them is older th- than the age of, none of the top 10 of the RAK have is over 25. I think only one of them has ever run a marathon in his life. This is the future of the marathon. I'm hyping it up. I'm like, look, if you want to know who's going to be good in the marathon, when Kipchoge goes, it's very well could these be these people. I am hyping them. I'm celebrating them. But I'm also celebrating this sort of unusual case. And I don't know. I mean, I, I'm not afraid to say that, you know, I don't know. Like, uh, I just think it's significant. I, I think to talk about, I don't know. I'm not, tr- people think you're trying to do code for race. I'm not doing, trying to do code for race. I, I do think the fact that he's white is somewhat significant. I don't really care. I mean, if he was, you know, uh, Samoan and running, I'd be shocked too. I mean, or an Indian runner. For, you know, for, from that would be an even bigger story. Yeah, I, I would be like, "Holy, what, what is this? This is totally unusual." Like, we've never seen a Samoan distance runner. Um, so I don't know. Like, everyone thinks you got some sinister thing because you're pointing it out. So well, it I don't know. It, it doesn't make sense to me. Like, we we celebrate diversity, except when if the diversity happens to involve a white person, probably particularly male, then it's like, don't mention it. Well, it is kind of interesting, right? Like we sort you do talk talk around the race of the white guy, but I mean, the white man's you know controlled a lot of stuff for a long time, so it's sort of interesting how I think maybe it's a little bit of a pushback. But in running, it's unique, and I think it's worth mentioning. Sort of related to that, we can have some listener audio. I've been promising to get this guy on for two weeks, and it's I don't think he's really talking about race, but he's sort of talking about how we should handle some issues. Do you guys want to hear what the Let's Run listener says? Bring it on. All right, here we go. Audio of the week, audio suggestion. This one isn't funny. It's kind of more serious, but here we go. From the Let's Run audio inbox. Hey, y'all. Just sending some feedback. Love the website, but would really like you to take issues like race and gender a little more seriously in 2019. I would recommend training all staff on how to interrupt when someone says things on the boards that, you know, offend particular underrepresented groups. Uh, You're really great on the running content, but sometimes really bad on those kinds of things. So just some soft feedback. There you go, guys. What'd you think of that? I don't have a problem first. First of all, we don't, I've been emailing. We don't want racist on let's run. People think we want racist. But, you know, part of the – it's, like, so stupid. It's, like, terrible for business. But you may find stuff that you may s- consider to be racist, but something some people may consider something offensive or even racist, and someone else may not. We don't want, like, people offending anyone. Obviously, underrepresented groups are sort of maybe more vulnerable, but, like, 
this guy's like, you know, be careful about what people are saying about unrepresented groups. I don't want you like being a dick to overrepresentative groups either. Having said that, you're going to read stuff you disagree with on Let's Run that's, you know, maybe offensive. And I think the caller was mainly talking about some of the like Castor Semenya stuff was going up. And, you know, we sort of have our own guidelines there about, I don't want people, you know, I want them using the pronouns she goes by essentially. But if people are going to say like, hey, I think she should be competing against men. We're going to allow that. And some people consider that sort of duly offensive, troublingly offensive. And that's their opinion. I'm going to let someone express it. So, you know, we're obviously not as woke as some people would want us to be, but it's not like we think about these things. Don't think about these things. And our encouragement to everyone is like, please keep reporting posts that you don't like to us. Email us. We do take these issues seriously, but we don't pre-screen content. You're going to find stuff that offends you on there. And I don't think it's the end of the world. Like we want to obviously delete stuff that's really offensive, but it's not a no offense zone in general. Yeah. First of all, I would say if you really want to reach us, call us 844-538-7786. That's 844-LET'S-RUN. Somebody will get your message for sure. We get a lot of emails, but, or report the post. But I was mess. I mean, not. I was responding to an email this week. You know, some some person basically said the same thing. I said, "Look, I'd be happy to pay for the staff to go to let's you know sensitivity training." This person was basically like, "Look, you can't even write about these issues because you have basically an all male white staff." And I'm like, "I don't know. I know you're the one making judgments. They're making judgments. They're basically calling Jonathan Galt a racist. I, I forgot for what. Do you remember, John? I showed you what he was emailing about. I think I just used the phrase Kenyan born in an article." which he viewed as somehow pejorative and racist. I don't really see how that's racist at all. Yeah. And it's just, I don't know. I mean, it it just, we can try to be sensitive, but I don't know. Castor Semenya is, is I respect her as a person. I think it'd be incredibly difficult to be what she's doing. I loved how she sort of flexed her muscles and sort of almost like a big F you to everybody this summer and just went crazy and, and did some amazing performances that doesn't mean that that I, I think that she shouldn't compete in the women's category. It doesn't mean that I think that these high school runners should be do- winning the women's, you know, running indoor track for men as men indoor track and then winning the state title as an outdoor track. I mean, that to me is pretty much common sense. I know that some people aren't going to respect that opinion just simply because I am a white male and that's unfortunate. And I think if you rule out my thoughts just because I am a white male, then I, I argue you're the one that's being racist and sexist. So, you know, in this day and age, a lot of people aren't going to agree with that, but I'm not going to back down. But if somebody can give me a, a, a good training we could go to, D.C., in Boston, Baltimore, New York, sign me up. Hey, be respectful on our message boards. This is somewhat related to the whole Gillette, Harry's, Dollar Shave Club thing, the Gillette ad and the sort of response. And some people really got offended by it. I think also there's this fake offense. I think pe- most people would see the point they're trying to make, not necessarily that like all men are sexist gropers, but you know, let's run might be more like, you know, dollar shave club, a little simpler, but I think their response was a good one. Take care of yourself, respect others, buy your stuff. So that was their response on what it means to be part of the club. And that's what we want. And let's run, take care of yourself, respect others. And Hey, Click those pages, baby. Somewhat of a joke. So, John, where were we saying we should we should go now? Oh, I th- I think we're pretty much good on this. I mean, there's not really any big events this weekend to preview. We've got USA Indoors coming up next weekend, but I think for now, any, unless there's anything else you guys want to touch on, I think we're pretty much good here. No, 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 folks. What? Okay, guys. Sorry. Before we leave, one more thing. Breaking news. Do 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 do. I'm very, very excited. I'm very excited about this, folks. I was criticized. Yeah, talk about fake, false outrage. Folks, in a world with like 6 billion people or how many billions of people there are, you can always find a few people on the internet that criticize you. But I was criticized by like the director of like the Abu Dhabi Dabai Running Club or something. After the Abu Dhabi Marathon, I immediately, within hours, nobody up on the electron staff was even up. I just said, this course can't be right. This course has to be short. This 5K split makes no sense. I don't believe these guys picked it up a ton in the second half of a hot marathon. 
And I said the course was short. I went out on a limb. People said I was wrong, that the, that the course tour was just a promotional tour. The actual course was different. And guess what, folks? I have breaking news to report. After I published my piece, the professors of the marathon, that's Helmut Winter in Germany, Sean Hartnett in Wisconsin, these are the guys that get in the pace vehicles at the world record attempts, and they tell you every kilometer, how they put up the splits on their website, how fast these are going so that the pace is perfect when Kip Choge breaks his world record. They became very interested in what I said. Helmut got on Google Maps and said that course is short. People say you can't do it on Google Maps. He's like, I can do it on Google Maps. But that wasn't good enough. We haven't heard back from the race organizers. They claimed they were going to get a measurement report and send it back to us. That was about a month ago. Anyways, they went to the RAK half, Sean and Helmut did. Then guess what? They got in a car and drove to Abu Dhabi. So they drove two and a half miles, two and a half hours, excuse me, across the Middle Eastern desert, I guess, and measured the course themselves. And I got the email this morning at 540. We're going to have this piece up hopefully later tonight. We're waiting for the photos to come through. But the course was almost exactly 200 meters short. Here's what they said. We were able to clear up the issue in less than an hour. The turning point close to the 34-kilometer mark came almost exactly 100 meters too early. We even found the correct marker for the turning point. We measured the course from 33 to 35 kilometers. In this segment, the course and race day was short by 200 meters. This is equivalent to time to about 33 to 33 seconds. So there you have it, folks. My gut instincts were proven right. I am very, very excited. I've always said, like, I don't even need drug tests. I know who's on drugs. I have a good idea who uh, some people are very likely to be on drugs. It used to be so obvious with these Russian middle distance runners, these Moroccans, a lot of them. It's getting a little bit harder now because people are tampering it down. But, folks, there it is, folks. Vindication. It's never felt so sweet. Congratulations, Robert. I know this is a big win for you. Yes, Robert, congratulations. And I think we can end on that. And actually, I found I thought of some audio to end with. It's letsrun.com pro runners reading mean letsrun.com message board post about them. So that'll be Robbie Andrews, Kyle Marbert, and Craig Lutz. We had it up on YouTube quite a while ago, but people probably haven't heard it. So we're going to end with that. Until then, if you've got audio, send it to us. Call in. Leave it for us. Robert, give them the phone number again. Four five three eight seven seven eight six eight four four. Let's run. If you're international, you can go to the message board, and there's a link. You can leave it through your computer. To all of our celebrity prominent listeners out there, thank you. And to everyone else out there, the running community, we thank you even more because you're the lifeblood of our community. And thanks for keeping us going. To Kamoy Campbell and his family, keep fighting. Hang in there. I hope the news keeps being positive. Until next week, this is Weldon Johnson signing off for Jonathan Galt and Robert Johnson. Thank you. How's it going, everybody? Uh, Robbie Andrews here, uh, U.S. 1500 meter runner. Uh, I'm here with uh, my buddy Cuff. Hey, what's up? My name is Kyle Merber. I run for the Hoka Oneone New Jersey New York Track Club. And today I'm going to read some me and Let's Run comments. Hey, Kyle, you look like a praying mantis. Is it true that Craig Lutz is a huge Nickelback fan? Yes. He's a slacker version of Webb. Wow. Well, first of all, I'm being compared to Alan Webb, so that's kind of cool. Kyle Merber is a crossfitter. True. I'd just like to point out that Lutz is not the top college freshman. In fact, the top college freshman could probably run circles around Lutz during the race, suffer an attack of irritable bowel syndrome, go to the bathroom, and still finish ahead of him. So Dunzo wrote, the dude is flat out lazy. Nothing more to see here. Craig Lutz looks like a 10 year old child. <laughs> Host Girth wrote, Robbie Andrews, who? Sorry, hard to find much enthusiasm for the guy. Wow, you sound like a lot like my ex girlfriend. So, okay, all right. I enjoy Merber's tweets. He understands he is a tiny white adult male, barely above the poverty line, that t- sometimes sleeps at his parents' house, which makes his stuff entertaining. Going to have to say it. Robbie Andrews is the ugly, unwanted baby, or Frodo Baggins and Shia LaBeouf. Well, that's unfortunate. There's a really big typo in there. And, you know, it had a lot of, it had a lot of potential for being funny. Um, again, being compared to Frodo Baggins and Shia LaBeouf. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and take that as a positive. Um, yeah, I'm going to go ahead and take that as a positive. Yeah, Frodo Baggins. Mm. Schmerber is done.
Tins have been beaten off since Swarthmore last year. Needs to take a hike. Go back to strong eyebrow. Let the big boys duke it out. Or while you admire your earrings in a mirror. This lunatic is everything that is wrong with collegiate running. Pretty boy who thinks he should get a free pass to the finals because he shit on people in one race. Get a life, man. I, for one, think this playboy needs to be taught a lesson. Try earning something for once in your life, bro. Just because you run for Texas doesn't mean people are going to lay down for you. This is an HHHW, bro. Show your stones or go home. Us Usurp wrote, Brazier will burn Andrews and his New Jersey Guido man bun at the trials. Just you wait. All right. So you have a few problems with that. One, the man bun was so 2015. It's that that's irrelevant now. Two, I was running the 1500 at the trials and everybody knew that. So I'll keep waiting, you sir, for Brazier to burn my man bun at the trials. Craig Lutz is a preseason top five whimper to DNF. He is the official choke artist of 2012. Mary Fonts wrote, he's a one trick pony, no guts. Um, uh, I have guts and I'm not a pony. Um, a dolphin. That's, uh, so wrong. Which pro distance runners like to hit the dank with some regularity? My money is on Evan Jager and Kyle Merber who also happen to be my two favorite runners. He is a piece of shit. I saw him at the armory at one of the meets my college team competed at, and as we were doing strides before an 800, I tried to give him a high five. Like most distance runners do, he looked at my hand and just looked away. Ever since, I have hoped for the demise of Andrews. Well, I, I deeply apologize that I, I missed a high five opportunity. I love high fives. If you know me at all, you know, I love high fives, um, slap hands, you know, it's, um, uh, and I, I hope you have more time on your hands than just hoping for my demise. Uh, I'd love to get a beer with you. Love to hang out. Um, I'll give you all the high fives you want. Uh, yeah, that's it though. Just high fives. Yeah.